10 Minute Jazz Lesson Podcast, Episode 376. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to episode 376 of the 10-Minute Jazz Lesson Podcast. If you're brand new to the show, welcome in. And if you're a returning listener, thank you so much for stopping back in. So this week is our Lick of the Month episode, and we are going to look at an awesome line from one of my favorite saxophone players, Seamus Blake. And this doesn't have too much of the diminished stuff that we've been talking about, but I actually don't think that we're far enough along to actually start taking a look at some vocabulary and actually making sense of it yet. So we may have to wait for next month's Lick of the Month before we really, really find something that's diminished heavy. However, uh, proof that this concept happens all over the place, there is actually a tiny little phrase with some diminished stuff in this. Uh, and we're going to talk about that, exactly what he's using. And it'll be a little bit of a um, preview of things to come, should I say. But before we jump into the show, just wanted to remind everybody this is a listener-supported podcast, which means that it's people like you, the people that are getting benefit out of this that keep us going. And we do that through Patreon in the form of a small monthly donation. In return for that donation, you do get PDFs and audio examples with every single episode. Along with when you sign up, you get our entire back catalog of all those PDFs and everything like that. So if you want to support the show, please go over to our website, 10minutejazzlesson.com, click on one of the Patreon banners, or go to patreon.com and search for the 10 Minute Jazz Lesson podcast. You'll find out more information and you can get instant access to everything we're talking about this week and all previous weeks. Wanted to give a quick shout out to some new patrons this week. Thank you to all of our new $5 patrons, Tanya, Grenville, Gabrielle, and Robert. Thank you so much for becoming part of the 10 Minute Jazz Lesson family. And if you want to be next, go over to Patreon, search for the 10 Minute Jazz Lesson podcast. All right, let's get into today's episode. So as I mentioned, we're going to take a look at a great Seamus Blake line. And if you don't know who Seamus is, man, you really got to go out there and find out who Seamus Blake is, one of the greatest saxophone players and musicians out there today. Now, this comes from a record that Seamus Blake and the other fantastic uh, saxophone player Chris Cheek did in 2016. Uh, and the record's called Let's Call the Whole Thing Off. And if you're a saxophone player, you have to be listening to this record. It is one of my favorites of all time. And Chris Cheek and Seamus playing together. Wow, it doesn't get much better than that. Ethan Iverson's on piano, Matt Pemmons on bass, and Jochen Rukert on drums. Wow, it's really, really pretty awesome. So go and check it out. And we're going to be looking at a little excerpt from Seamus' soul on the title track, Let's Call the Whole Thing Off, which is a absolutely fantastic jazz standard that I think everybody should know. All right, so we're going to take a look at this little excerpt that's five measures long, uh, spills over into a sixth measure. But there's a lot of things that I want to talk about, including one little aspect of this diminished stuff that we've been talking about in the previous two episodes. We're just going to pinpoint one place where Seamus is actually using a diminished arpeggio. But first, let's listen to the solo excerpt just a couple of times just to get it into our ears. It goes by kind of fast. Uh, so we'll listen to it two or three times, and then we're going to break down some aspects of this line. All right, here's the phrase a couple times for you. So pretty brilliant phrase, right? And it's so exciting, even though it's only like five bars, it's just such an exciting thing to listen to. So let's talk about why it's so exciting. Well, the first thing that we notice in the first measure is that he's playing this run of triplets. Do ba do do ba do do ba do do dot dot. And so I wanna draw your attention to the fact that he plays three triplets 
and then comes out of those triplets into eighth notes with a little bit of syncopation. So we have these three triplets, one, dicka da dicka da dicka da and then on the downbeat of the next measure, he goes, do dit dot. Now, this is a really good lesson, actually, that we can take a lot from, is that we want the flexibility to go between rhythmic subdivisions at will. And of course, Seamus Blake has that ability. So he's going, one, do dit dot. And coming out of those triplets into the eighth notes, and they swing so hard, and they feel so good, is really what makes that line rhythmically. Now, if you look at your PDF, I've also highlighted some notes in red, okay? And those notes are actually a diminished seventh arpeggio. Now, what have we been getting into the past couple of weeks? We've been talking about the diminished scale and the diminished arpeggios. So here it is in action, and we don't need to worry about what's actually going on harmonically. I just want you to notice that he straight up plays right up a diminished seventh arpeggio, starting on the concert B, which is the last note in the second triplet. That's a mouthful. But if you look at the first measure, the second triplet that appears, the last note is a concert B, and then he goes right up four notes of a diminished seventh arpeggio. So we should just take note of that, that this diminished stuff that we're studying, we actually have seen it in a solo already. We don't really need to concern ourselves with why it's being used, how it's being used. We'll get to that later. Just notice that it's there, okay? And those notes are highlighted in red on your PDF. Okay, so let's keep going. And I want to stick with the rhythmic thing because I think that's really what's creating the interest here. So if we go into the third bar, all of a sudden we see him use another subdivision of a triplet, which is a 16th note triplet. And this is very, very typical of bebop playing. Charlie Parker sort of like revolutionized the use of this. He would use it all over the place. So we see a 16th note triplet followed by this run of eighth notes that lasts for basically two measures. And then in the second to last measure of the excerpt, we see him use another 16th note triplet on beat two on the second to last measure. So we're starting to see the power of the triplet through Seamus's playing here. And I wouldn't call this solo like a quote unquote bebop solo, but I also just want you to notice how many bebop elements are in this and how clear it is that Seamus has studied that bebop language which I think we just all have to do, right? There's no way around it. The world, the jazz world changed after bebop. And that's just a thing that we all have to learn to do, even if we don't really want to go out and play bebop. We have to study that language because it's a part of our modern lexicon uh, in terms of jazz. You just have to know that now. We can't ignore it, right? All right, so now let's look at some of the note choices that he's making starting in measure three. Measure three is not all that complicated. However, measure four is really interesting because what do we see? We see a concert C7 flat nine going to a concert F minor seven chord. So I would classify that as five to one. C7 flat nine being the five chord in the key of F minor. Now, what's he doing over the concert C7 flat nine chord? Well, he's playing uh, an altered sound. So we see him play these notes. He's playing seven, one, flat nine, and then flat 13 over that. Those are the four notes that happen over that C7 flat nine chord. So then he resolves to the ninth over that F minor chord, which is also really interesting. So we get this really quick and really well done little uh, altered sound that resolves to the ninth, which is also a really, really interesting place to resolve. Resolving to the ninth instead of the you know, third or fifth is an interesting choice to make. So it sounds like this. So if you want to take something away from this line harmonically, that might be a really, really cool little snippet to take and start to think about how you could work that into your own vocabulary. 
you know, come up with some ways to use that resolution point uh, from the flat six into the nine of the one chord. Uh, think about altered and the different ways that you could use altered based off of what Seamus is doing here. So harmonically, I think that's the most interesting part that you could dive into and possibly come out of it with some of your own vocabulary or some brand new ideas, okay? But I still think that really the rhythmic part of this is the most interesting. Seamus is such a master of rhythm. Uh, I think that's really where it's at in terms of um, things we can gain from this, the triplet stuff, the transition between the different subdivisions, and how mastering that can really add this incredible dimension uh, into our playing. So let me know what you think. Hopefully you got something out of this. Remember, you can grab the PDF of this line with some of the stuff highlighted and see all the things that we just talked about on paper by supporting the podcast with a very small monthly donation. And you can do that by going to 10minutejazzlesson.com, clicking on Patreon banner, or you can go to patreon.com and search for the 10 Minute Jazz Lesson podcast. All right, we will see you next week with our tune of the month. We'll be doing an etude, all that good stuff. And uh, then we'll continue with our series on Diminished. Hope you're all doing well out there, staying safe and healthy, and have a great weekend, everybody. Talk to you soon. Bye. <music>